Welcome to Miss Cunningham's EOC Review Part 1. This is going over language standards for your EOC. Remember that you might want to take notes on the handout I gave you with all the terms. I will go in order. Um, as well, you might want to make sure that you take down any questions you have, write them down. That way I can answer them in class if you need further explanation on any of these. Now this is a quick review, so I'm not going to go very in-depth with these topics, but I'm going to cover the bare essentials of what you'll need for the EOC. So let's start with parts of speech. Hopefully you all know these by now, but let's do a brief review. We have our noun, which is a person, place, thing, or idea. Our verb can either show action or state of being and link a subject to a predicate. We have an adjective, which describes a noun. Adverb describes everything except nouns. It can describe adjectives, other verbs, um, other adverbs, or a verb. Preposition shows position. That's words like in or on. Conjunctions join parts of sentences or sentences together. Interjections are the random things that interject into a sentence like wow or hey. And a pronoun is a word that takes the place of a noun like he, they, or me. So let's look at an example sentence. The honey badger does not care about the EOC or me. Let's look at the different um, parts of speech in this sentence. First, the is an adjective. It describes the noun honey badger. Even though you would say it's an article, it is an article, but an article is a type of adjective. So honey badger is an animal, that's a thing, so it's a noun. Now here we have does not care. Let's go ahead and put all of those up. So does care is one kind of one verb. Care is our main verb. Does is our helping verb. It shows the action of the sentence. And not is an adverb. It describes the verb does care. So it adds on information saying don't care. About is a preposition. The is an adjective describing the noun EOC, which is a test. It's a thing, so it's a noun. Then we have the conjunction or and the pronoun me. So the pronoun me is taking place of the noun Miss Cunningham or whoever me is. And our conjunction um, joins the noun EOC to the pronoun me. Next, the parts of the sentence. So this one's a little more difficult. The subject, remember, is usually at the beginning of the sentence and it is what the sentence is about. So an example subject could be the honey badger. Next, we have an action verb, so it's going to show the action of the sentence. So, gave would be an example of an action verb. Next, I'm going to introduce you to two different things um, that are a little more tricky. We have an indirect object and a direct object. So, remember that to have a direct object, um, what a direct object is, is something, a word that receives the action of a sentence. Um, it's going to be a noun or pronoun, and it receives the action of the sentence. So in this one, our subject, the honey badger, has the action gave, the honey badger gave, and the direct object answers the question, what? What did he give? He gave a dead snake. That's our direct object. It receives the action. This is like when we did the example in class where I had someone hit someone else. Um, the person receiving the action was the person who was hit. So, you gave a dead snake. Indirect object is a little different. So an indirect object can only happen if you already have a direct object, and it usually, almost always, comes in between the action verb and the direct object, just like this one. An indirect object, while a direct object receives the action of the sentence, an indirect object usually somehow receives the direct object. So what that means in this sentence, the honey badger gave a dead snake you could rephrase, and almost always you can rephrase the indirect object to, with the word to. The honey badger gave a dead snake to me, or the honey badger gave to me a dead snake. Um, we don't need the word to, and without it, it makes it an indirect object. The honey badger gave me a dead snake. Next, we have a different example. Here's a subject, the honey badger, and we're going to use a linking verb. So remember that a linking verb 
unlike an action verb, does not show action, but rather just links the subject of the sentence to whatever is in the predicate, kind of like an equal sign, showing that the subject is equal to the predicate. So um, we're going to learn something new, a subject complement, to go with that. So the honey badger, the subject, is, with the linking verb, awesome. Subject complement is basically anything that follows a linking verb that is linked to the subject of the sentence. It can be either an adjective or a noun. So this one's an adjective, a subject complement that's an adjective. The honey badger is awesome. We could also say the honey badger is a mammal. That would still be a subject complement. The last thing we need to learn is an object complement right here. So an object complement can only happen in a sentence where we have a subject, an action verb, a direct object, and an object complement. So you're going to have an action verb and a direct object in order to have an object complement. An object complement is a word that complements the direct object. It kind of renames or goes with the direct object. So Miss Cunningham named the honey badger Walter. Um, the direct object is honey badger because it receives the action of being named but Walter is what I renamed it. So it's not an indirect object. We're not being given, uh, the honey badger is not being given Walter. It is complementing the direct object, honey badger. So on your EOC, they're going to ask you, um, they're going to probably give you a sentence and ask you what the pattern of the sentence is. So your options can be something really simple like subject and action verb, the honey badger gave. It could be subject, ac action verb, direct object, Miss Cunningham named the honey badger. Or it can be more complex with subject, action verb, indirect object, direct object, or subject, linking verb, subject, complement, um, or finally, subject, action verb, direct object, object, complement. Those are your options. So you need to know those terms. Next, we move on to types of sentences. So to know types of sentences, you need to know that a clause is a subject and a verb and that our two main types of clauses are independent and dependent. So once we know that, we can figure out the type of sentence a sentence is. Let's start with a simple sentence. Remember that a simple sentence is one independent clause, like this one. The honey badger doesn't care. That is a clause with a subject and a verb, but it is independent because it can stand by itself. Now remember, a dependent clause cannot stand by itself, and we'll get to one of those later. So there's our simple sentence. Now we need a compound sentence. A compound sentence is made of two independent clauses. So we need to add on an independent clause here. The honey badger doesn't care, he eats snakes. Two independent clauses joined by a comma in conjunction make a compound sentence. Next, we need a complex sentence. Here's where the dependent clause comes in. In a complex sentence, you need one independent clause and one dependent clause. So here's our independent clause, the honey badger doesn't care. And here's our dependent clause, because the honey badger is hardcore. So notice that this one is dependent because it cannot stand by itself. If we just said, because the honey badger is hardcore, we would need more to the sentence to make that a complete thought. So combining the independent and dependent makes it a complex sentence. Notice for our next part of this that there is no comma in between care and because. Uh, when you have an independent and dependent clause, you do not need a comma unless we put the dependent clause in front, and we'll get to that later. So next is a compound complex sentence. This is just what it sounds like. It's a compound sentence, two independent clauses, combined with the element of the complex, which is a dependent sentence. So we need two independent and one dependent clause to make a compound complex sentence. So that would read a combination of these. The honey badger doesn't care and he eats snakes because the honey badger is hardcore. That would be a compound complex sentence. Moving on to tricky punctuation, commas and quotation marks. Here's a sentence that will help us with all of our comma needs. Because he is hardcore, the honey badger, a medium-sized mammal, doesn't care, and he eats snakes, bees, and anything else he wants. This will show us how we need to use our commas. There are really four main ways to use a comma, and when in doubt, it's best to leave it out. 
Don't use a comma unless you know it's necessary. And here are the four ways it can be necessary. First, introductory phrases or clauses. So here's a dependent clause and we put a comma after it, separating it from the independent clause. That is because it comes at the introductory part of the sentence or the beginning of the sentence. So if you have a phrase or clause at the beginning, you can separate it with a comma from the rest of the sentence because he is hardcore. Next, non-essential elements. So in this part we have an appositive. An appositive or any other non-essential information can be set off with a comma. Because he is hardcore, the honey badger, a medium-sized mammal, we could take that out and it would still keep the meaning of the sentence. So we set it off in commas. Next, to separate independent clauses with a conjunction. That's the main use for a comma. We have independent clause here, um, the honey badger doesn't care. And then we have uh, independent clause here, he eats snakes, bees, and anything else. So we have our comma and conjunction to separate those. Next and finally, to separate three or more items in a series. So snakes, bees, and anything else he wants. Remember to use a comma after every item in a series until you use the conjunction. So next is quotation marks. Or there's the arrow for that. Next is quotation marks. And for quotation marks, um, what is important to know is how to use other punctuation marks with quotation marks. What you need to know is you need a comma to introduce a quote. The honey badger said, I don't care. So you would use that there. And notice the exclamation mark is inside the quotation marks. In fact, almost all the time, your punctuation needs to be inside the quotation marks. Almost always. Notice that said Miss Cunningham interrupts this quote. So we put a comma before we get said Miss Cunningham. Then we get a comma introducing the quote again. Again, the period goes inside the quotation marks. Here is one example where the punctuation would go outside of the quotation. And that is if you have um, an important punctuation mark like a, qu a question mark or an exclamation point. And that important punctuation is used for the whole sentence and not the quote itself. For instance, in this one, it wouldn't make sense to say the honey badger doesn't care. That's not what we're saying. The honey badger doesn't care isn't a question. This whole sentence, what do you mean when you say the honey badger doesn't care, is our question. Therefore, the question mark goes outside of the quotation marks. That's really one of the only instances where that would happen. All right, so moving on. Shifts and agreement. This can be difficult because there are a lot of rules for it, but basically there are a few simple things you can do to help you with it. So let's start with tense shift. So basically a shift means that you start in one, start writing one way and change in the middle of the sentence or in the middle of the paragraph. So in this sentence, for tense shift, you shift from present tense to past tense. We have present tense, does not care, and it shifts to past tense, was. We don't want that. We could fix that by saying the honey badger doesn't care and he is hardcore. Point of view shift. This one starts out in third person if one wants to find a honey badger, but then it switches to second person. You should look in the most dangerous place. That's wrong. You, need, you could say if one wants to find a honey badger, he should look in the most dangerous place. Next, a subject verb agreement. The only way to do this is to take your time and look at the subject, which is the list, and the verb, which is are. Our subject is singular, one list. Our verb is plural, so that's incorrect. Should be the list is extensive. It's trying to confuse you because you see the word animals as plural. So if we said dangerous animals are extensive, that would be correct. But we, our subject is actually the list. So take the time to look for the subject and look for the verb. Don't just go with, sound, with what sounds right. Next, pronoun antecedent agreement. So, the student loves honey badger so much that they have posters all over their wall. Incorrect. Also incorrect there. There's one student, so it should be he or she. It should not be they. That makes it plural. And finally, words and phrases. These you will have to look at on your own. So, please let me know if you have any questions about these or anything else in the presentation. Thank you and come prepared tomorrow.